Uh, this morning, we are continuing in our study in the book of Acts, and we are in the end of Acts chapter 15. We're going to begin with verse 36, and we're actually going to cross into the first five verses of chapter 16. The title of this morning's message is, When Christians Have Conflict. So we're going to talk about Paul and Barnabas and the conflict that they had and the resulting things that we can learn as God's people reading his word. So I invite you to open up a Bible. Uh, it's page 924 in your worship Bibles if you're using one of the ones there in front of you. And uh, please stand as we open to Acts chapter 15, verse 36 and following. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, who is called Mark. But Paul thought it best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it speaks with clarity and description about how your people acted in certain times and places and, and doesn't skate by things, even the things that are hard. Help us as we look into this, your word today. Give us wisdom from your spirit to live it out in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Conflict is hard. Does anyone out there like conflict? Just a show of hands. I don't even like talking about conflict, let alone having conflict. I remember a conflict in my extended family over 30 years ago. My cousin was engaged to a young man. However, some of the members of the family did not approve, including her mother. You can understand the tension. Some of those family members who did not approve, they had chosen that they were not going to attend the wedding. Other family members wanted to support my cousin regardless of her choice. They were going to the wedding. My parents took our family down to visit my aunt and the other cousins. And as kids, we were just upstairs playing in the bedroom and hanging out and getting familiar with our cousins again. It had been a little while since we'd seen them. Suddenly, my mom came into the bedroom where we were playing, and through tearful eyes, she said two words, we're going. My dad and my aunt, his sister, had had such a sharp disagreement that my aunt had just said that everyone better just leave. And I remember that car ride home was really quiet. We lived several hours away. And we, I think we probably couldn't afford to just stay over hotel, at a hotel last minute, all six of us. And so we drove all the way home from Chicago back to Milwaukee. Conflict is hard. What I learned that day about conflict was that conflict is stressful. Conflict is confusing. And it's painful and it feels better if you can just avoid it. Anyone with me? I'm sure all of us can relate to one situation or another in our families of origin, or our family by extension, that we have uh, felt some of, something like this. See, all of us are significantly shaped by our family of origin, aren't we? The phrase my wife and I like to use is, normal is how you grew up. <laughs> Whatever you grew up in, that's just what you assume. Everyone else in the world out there does as well. How your family of origin 
handled conflict was either a model you follow or a pattern you studiously avoid. As Christians now, though, we belong to a new family, don't we? The new family of Jesus. When you put your faith in Jesus, you're adopted by God the Father. The Holy Spirit sends his spirit into your heart and you cry out, Abba, Father. And now we are brothers and sisters in Christ, aren't we? We are the family of God on the mission of God by the power of God. That's our motto here. And everyone who's a Christian is part of the family of Jesus. So now we're called to learn how to live in a new family, how to set aside our family of origin. But it's a process, and simply becoming a Christian doesn't simp- like suddenly fix all that, does it? Right. Oh, how I wish it would. <laughs> in fact, many Christians actually avoid conflict and don't handle it very well because they have some misunderstandings about Jesus' words. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. We often, though, settle for a false peace instead of a true peace. So we misinterpret that and think, All right, I'm going to be a peacemaker, which just means I'm just not going to make a fuss. I'm not going to interrupt the course of events. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about this problem of false peace between uh, Paul and Peter, that they had a false peace that was going on there. The Apostle Peter tried to appease the circumcision party in Galatians 2, and he was, it says he was afraid of the circumcision party. He tried to just smooth things over, and he ended up in hypocrisy, uh, avoiding the Gentiles during that season. When we ourselves, out of fear, avoid conflict in order to appease other people, we are false peacemakers. It can and does happen to all of us. Let me give you a few examples, compliments of Pete and Jerry Scazzaro in their Emotionally Healthy Discipleship Course 2, which focuses on emotionally healthy relationships. Here's a couple examples that, from their book. Carl is upset by the behavior of his spouse, who constantly comes in late after work. He says nothing. Why? He thinks he is being like Christ by not saying anything, although he does give her a cold shoulder. He is a false peacemaker. Pam disagrees with her coworkers at lunch when they slander her boss, but she's afraid to speak up. She just goes along. She says to herself, I don't want to kill the atmosphere by speaking up and disagreeing. She's a false peacemaker. Uh, I love this one. Bob goes to dinner with 10 people. Bob has been really trying to save money lately. He's in debt. He's trying to get out of it. And so, because he's so tight financially, he just orders a salad and an appetizer. Meanwhile, the other nine people order steak and wine and desserts. When the bill comes, someone says, let's divide the bill equally. It will take forever to figure this all out. Everyone agrees. Bob is dying on the inside, right? But he won't say anything. He's a false peacemaker. One last example. Yolanda, she's engaged. She would like more time to rethink her decision about her marriage, but she is afraid that her fiancé and his family will become angry. She goes through with the wedding. She's a false peacemaker. The problem with all these scenarios is that the way of peace will never come by pretending that what is wrong is right. What we need to do is to learn to hold on to our true selves be distinct about what we believe and what is important to us, what we value, but also remain close to other people and remain together with them. And often, the reason why we don't like conflict is because we fear that speaking out will disrupt and damage the relationship and that the relationship will end or get worse or be conflicted if we speak up for the sake of truth. The good news is is that's not necessarily the case. There are paths forward where we can seek peace and pursue it speaking the truth in love, and actually strengthen our relationship instead of seeing the end of our relationship. So today we're going to look into this passage, and we're going to see an historical example of conflict here with Paul and Barnabas. Then we're going to talk about preventing and resolving conflict. And then lastly, we'll talk about processing and healing from conflict you may have had. So let's start with the historical example that's before us, what Luke calls a sharp disagreement. Now, just before we read it, 
sometimes the Bible prescribes what we ought to do, and sometimes the Bible describes what has happened. See, not every example in the Bible that happens means that we're supposed to do it. David slept with Bathsheba. That is not an example to follow. Here, Luke is describing what actually happened. And I love how the Bible is so real with people. We see Paul and Peter debating. We see Paul and Barnabas getting problems here. We see in the Gospels, the disciples are, you know, they argue with each other. I mean, you just read through the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and you go, oh my gosh, this family of origin, what a mess. It's almost scandalous how the Bible reveals so many faults and failures of his own people, isn't it? But the Bible is true. And so the Bible here is describing what happened. And Luke doesn't give us a lot of analysis. He doesn't really slow down and tell us the intricacies of what happened or what that sharp disagreement produced. Did it, was it an angry fight? Was, did they fight well and clean and just agree to disagree? We don't know a lot about that, but it gives us this platform to talk about it. It is, first of all, also ironic that Peter and Paul had that big dispute in Galatians 2 that now gets resolved in Acts 15. And they have all this theological stuff to work on and they get to unity. And now they get home, they're going to go on a missionary journey and now they're disagreeing about personnel. Does that seem weird to you? Just a little bit. But here it is. John Mark had left early in the first missionary journey. And for someone who couldn't bear the travel... What would he do when persecution arose? You see, Paul has a good point, doesn't he? On the other hand, at the same time, Barnabas is living up to his name. Son of encouragement. He believes the best about other people. The same spirit that caused Barnabas to seek out Paul when Paul was misunderstood by the early Christians after his conversion and introduced him to the church, that same spirit in Barnabas is reaching out to John Mark. And wants to believe the best about John Mark as well. Besides, Mark is his cousin. Ah, but maybe that's the problem in Paul's eyes. Nepotism. You know that word nepotism, right? The word nepotism comes from nephew. When you favor a family member and hire them or include them or favor them because of your relationship with them, not because of their performance or maybe despite poor performance. Either way, Luke describes their conflict as a sharp disagreement. Now, there is such a thing as necessary endings. We have to recognize this too. Sometimes we need to be willing to let go of work or ministry relationships in order to move forward. I know, I know this sounds odd, right? Shouldn't we just all get along? Sometimes the church focuses so much on unity that we strain through false peace when really there should be some transitions that might happen. Uh, Henry Cloud in his book, Necessary Endings, actually says something very funny. He says this, Necessary endings are the reason why you are not married to your prom date and you are not still working your first job. Somehow that prom, unless anyone married their prom date out there? Okay, there are a few people, okay. <laughs> Those are good decisions. Marry your high school sweetheart. But the rest of us, we moved on at some point, and that was okay. It was hard. It changed, and things happened. Sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's wrong. I don't know if I got in trouble for asking that question or not. <laughs> so <laughs> we're just going to move on. Uh, the endings of partnership don't imply the end of the road. As we're going to see by the end of the sermon, this is not the last word on John Mark. But this is the conflict that happens. And Paul and Barnabas have such a, a disagreement about whether or not John Mark is acceptable to be on this trip that they actually agree to go different directions with different people. We're told that Barnabas takes John Mark with him, and Paul takes Silas, who we met earlier in the chapter, and uh, they go uh, northbound while Barnabas and John Mark go westbound across the ocean. So, that's the historical moment. Let's talk about preventing and resolving conflict. I think it's important that we have to be honest, first of all, about our differences of opinion. Uh, this is what we're talking about when we talk about disrupting false peace. To be a true peacemaker after the manner of Jesus, we have to be willing to speak the truth in love. Amos 3.3 3 says this, Can two walk together unless they agree about the direction? Let me tell you a story about a personal story. Uh, 
ministry conflict I experienced about two and a half years ago. I encountered and went through a very significant ministry conflict with a dear brother in the Lord. My good friend Ross and I, Ross Shearer, had really hurt each other. He visited me in my office and told me that he was going to be leaving Grace Covenant, leaving our church. I was floored. I, I really didn't see it coming. We had had some issues and some conflict, but they didn't seem like anything that couldn't have been worked out in my estimation. We did pursue a path of reconciliation in our relationship, but we did not rebuild our partnership in ministry. In retrospect, I believe our split could have been prevented, but neither of us really had the tools or the communication strength to handle that situation in a better way. It taught me a ton about conflict and about people and gave me a new path of looking forward to how I can stay true to myself, speak the truth in love, but also strengthen relationships around me. A tool that we were encouraged to use by the person that did our reconciliation was called the Ladder of Integrity. And uh, when you came into worship today, there was a sheet that you were given. Hopefully you got it. If you didn't, uh, we have some extra copies. It's, it says at the top here, climb the ladder of integrity. Uh, this uh, exercise here is one that you can use if you're needing to clarify your values in the context of conflict with another person. Now, uh, the authors of this don't necessarily recommend this as like a conflict resolution tool, uh, but a good friend of mine named Dave actually uses this very successfully in a lot of people that are facing conflict. And uh, what Ross and I both in encountered as we... Uh, work through these steps in the letter of integrity was that we were actually looking now into our, ourselves instead of out at each other and the, the, the problem that was across the room. So let me just tell you a little bit about this and then I'm going to give a, I'm going to model uh, what this looks like to talk through the ladder from the bottom rung, number one, all the way up to the top, number 10. So first of all, the letter helps you to get honest and clear about what's going on inside of you. Secondly, it helps you to uncover and clarify your values so that you can assert yourself with the, another person if it's appropriate. And it's primarily for getting clear about yourself. Really, the biggest thing that we often need to do is to be clear about what's important to us and pause and kind of understand what's going on inside before we're really prepared to talk with each other about the struggles that we face or that we feel. Uh, the first four rungs of the letter are about thoughts and feelings. You start with, uh, right now, the issue on my mind is. And number two, my part in this is. And number three, my need in this issue is. And number four, my feelings about this are. So you're really thinking about, like, where are you at? And the, the key to actually doing this well is to think about only one issue at a time. When I first started working with the Ladder of Integrity, I had like five or six, and I had to figure out like, what is the one issue that is really the most important thing to talk about? And so uh, as you look at that issue on your mind, then you just continue to use the sentence stems as the prompt to kind of finish the sentence. And when you do so, an amazing thing happens, that you begin to really see what you're thinking and what's important to you, and you're guided through this conversation. As you go through five through eight, you begin to focus on the values or virtues that are at work. And then numbers nine and 10 are the hopeful things that you hope will happen. So what I'd like to do here is I'd like to give an example of using the ladder of integrity, hypothetically, as if the apostle Paul were doing these 10 statements for you, for us, and doing them with Barnabas. So imagine that the apostle Paul and Barnabas had gotten into this sharp disagreement and Pete Scazzaro came from the future and came back here and said, hey, uh, Paul, why don't you try using this document here? And the Apostle Paul expressed himself in this way. And so this is what I imagine the Apostle Paul might have said in real simplified summary version. Number one, the issue on my mind, Bar Barnabas, is that I'm hurt by John Mark's desertion in Pamphylia on that first missionary journey. You see there's some hurt there in Paul? I think that really did hurt him. Number two, the Apostle Paul might say this, my part in this is that I allowed our difference of opinion to become a sharp disagreement. Number three, my need. My need in this 
is that everyone on our missions team is completely trustworthy. We face many perils in hostile situations. I need to know that every member of our team will endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus. It's a pretty important need, isn't it? See where Paul's coming from. Number four, my feelings about this are fear of team breakdown and doubts about Mark's readiness. I'm also angry that you're playing favorites because John Mark is your cousin. <laughs> Number five, this issue is important to me because I value integrity and perseverance on these trips. Number six, I am and I am not. I am willing, I am willing to talk with John Mark personally about my concerns but I am not willing to take John Mark this time. Number seven. One thing I could do to improve the situation is to seek to be a better encourager to Mark, just like you are, Barnabas. Number eight. The most important thing I want you to know is that I love you and your cousin, but that God may be leading us in different directions for a season of time. Number nine, I think my honest sharing will benefit our relationship by speaking the truth in love. He's quoting himself there in Ephesians 4, right? And not breaking up on bad terms. Barnabas, I may never see you again. So I want to keep short accounts. Will you forgive me for speaking in anger? Number 10. I, I hope and look forward to the day when John Mark has demonstrated maturity in Christ. By taking next steps that can build a track record of accountability. All right, did you see how that process works? I'm actually really into this story. I mean, I feel this viscerally. It's because I learned this with my friends when I had conflict, and it just it brings back some of that history in me and my feelings of what it felt like to be in deep conflict, but to really care about another person enough to work it out. See, that's what it means to be part of the body of Christ. That's what Paul and Barnabas had to work on. And it was hard. Life is hard. It doesn't just get easy because you're a Christian. We talk about, you know, Jesus is coming back, life is good, I'm, you know, da-da-da, we have a lot of platitudes. But life is hard, especially in ministry, especially in the church. We're close to each other, and so we're bound to have some sparks. But by God's grace, there are paths forward that when we understand where we are, we can significantly be a, a source of reconciliation and grace to other people if we're willing to speak the truth in love. So I hope that what you'll do is take home this sheet and think about a situation in your life where maybe you are struggling to speak up or there's a, a, something that's happening between you and another person, maybe some sort of conflict. And uh, on a separate sheet of paper, kind of start with these sentence stems and then just write out where you're at. You may never actually deliver what you write out to that other person with whom you have conflict. That's not really necessarily the point. But it, you'll be amazed at how much it'll help you to understand and to clarify what's important to you, where you're um, acting out of feelings, where those feelings need to be understood more clearly, and where those values need to be embraced and held on to as you understand yourself distinctly as an individual, but also want to pursue relationship with other people. All right, so the third thing I want to do as we close here is just to talk about processing and healing from conflict. What do you do after a conflict has occurred? I have three subpoints in this one. The first thing I think we need to do when we've experienced conflicts is that we need to take some time to grieve losses when there's been damage to the relationship or a separation in the relationship. Although endings are sometimes necessary, like it seemed to be with Paul and Barnabas, they also entail loss. And you may no longer be close to that other person or regularly see them. That's a big loss 
in your life. It's important to recognize those losses. We, we often talk about losses in terms of like the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, or some like what seem like really big losses. In fact, I hear this among Christians when someone has a really big thing that they have a prayer request for, and then it feels like no one else in the group wants to share their prayer request because that one seems so big over here. But sometimes losses that we experience that don't sound very big can be just huge, devastating things. They're all about our perception and our position, our point of view in the situation. It's important to take time to feel your losses and to process them. I recommend journaling and writing about what you're feeling about things or talking about it with a counselor or a trusted friend who understands and is just willing to listen to your heart. I, that's what I like about my journal. It's always there listening. It never talks back to me. Number two, it's good to look at ways that God is at work even in the midst of our weakness. God is always at work, amen? amen? He will even work through poor human decisions. It's, it's notable that out of this one partnership of Paul and Barnabas, now two missionary journeys actually emerge, and God uses that for good. God uses it to bring Silas along, and eventually Timothy comes into the picture in chapter 16. As a result of the first missionary journey, Timothy had actually already become a disciple, and there he is in Lystra. His mother was a Jewish and his, Jewess, and his father was a Greek, and he's well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. And so God actually does something new in that new space with Paul and Silas, and they're ready to serve in a new way, and new people are added to the team. Now, like, this is a great way to start new churches, to have a conflict, but that does happen, and we all know what that feels like. So we need to look for the places where God is at work in the situation. How is God at work even though we were at work in a negative way? God can be work at in a positive way. It's what Romans 8.28 says, right? And we know that in all things, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God is working all things together for good, even our mistakes, even our failures, even our conflict. It doesn't justify the conflict, but we can look back and grieve it and look forward with hope because we know God is still going to work in our lives. Thirdly, don't give up on people. Here's the principle. No one is ever a lost cause, ever. The story of John Mark's maturity and ministry is phenomenal as we can uh, piece it through through the different p places in Paul's writing subsequent to this event. So recall that John Mark left with Barnabas, who is his cousin. And yet later we see in Colossians and Philemon in particular, the apostle Paul speaking about Mark. Here's what he says in Philemon chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. Epaphras my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus sends greetings to you, and so do, get this, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. Here's the ending, my fellow workers. What a glorious story. What a wonderful ending. Turns out John Mark is on the team. He just had to go down to the farm league for a little while. <laughs> Colossians 4.10 says the same thing. I think Colossians and Philemon are written at the same time frame, sent to the same location. Um, Epaphras is in both of them. But Colossians 4.10 says this, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. In other words, Paul trusts Mark so much, he can send him someplace else with a specific task or assignment or ministry or mission, and Mark will get it done. And Paul can count on him. That's awesome. Listen to this, 2 Timothy in, pa in Paul's pastoral epistle, 2 Timothy 4.11. Paul writes this. Luke. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. For he is very useful to me for ministry. Wow. 
He's very useful to me. Now he wants Mark to come back to him. He sent Mark away for a purpose. Now he wants Mark to come back. He needs Mark next to him. He's alone. He only has Luke. He's in prison. He doesn't know how many more days he has. Maybe he has another assignment from Mark. Maybe he just needs Mark's presence and Mark's company. Did you know that John Mark is the author of a book of the Bible? The Gospel According to Mark. Wow. That's pretty like A-team status, isn't it? Way to go, John Mark. Way to go, Barnabas. Being a son of encouragement. Way to go, Paul, for reconciling relationships and believing that no one's a lost cause. Isn't the kingdom of God a dynamic and exciting place where God is taking broken lives and broken people and putting them back together? That you, like living stones, are coming together like a great house built and fashioned by our Lord and Savior Jesus. Peter himself is probably the one who gave John Mark the content for the Gospel of Mark. Peter in 1 Peter 5.13 says this, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son, son in the faith. Before the end of his life, John Mark was connected closely with Paul and Peter, performing correspondence between the two, and going on missions, and coming back to be in personal ministry with the Apostle Paul and Peter at different points in his life. What a great success story. Isn't it amazing what God can do in the midst of human conflict? I don't really have a conclusion to the sermon. Here's what I want you to do. There's a story in your life that's not finished. What is it the next step for you? What will the next chapter look like in your relationships with other people? Will you follow the model of understanding who you are and clarifying where you're at, but in speaking the truth and love to other people to sustain and strengthen the relationships that we, you and that person, you and others can move forward with grace that's provided by our Savior Jesus. It's my challenge for you this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who loves to take our messy, messed up human situations and work them together for your glory and for our good. We thank you for the amazing, dynamic development that happened with John Mark. That even though he was a deserter and was not valued by Paul at the outset of the second missionary journey, that you enabled him to grow in maturity not just be a new believer or a growing disciple, but a disciple-making disciple who had an impact, who was an emissary. And we thank you that that occurred because loving brothers and sisters in John Mark's life didn't give up on him and didn't write him off. Help us, Lord, to be those kind of examples, those kind of models to other people. Help us to be willing to encounter and face conflict, not be settling for a false peace, but to speak the truth and love that in all ways we may all grow into maturity into Jesus Christ. That you might be glorified, that your gospel may go forward, that your kingdom may rule over all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.